CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, is back to normalcy. As uh, normal as we get, uh, I am Tim Graham of The Athletic here with Jonah Bronstein of Bronstein Amalgamated. Uh, I should say formerly Bronstein Amalgamated, uh, now the uh, publisher of the uh, new Bronstein Times, of course. And uh, Jonah... Actually, uh, we, we changed our name. We merged again. It's draftbronsteinkings.com. Oh, I didn't know this. Uh, is this owned by Lee Enterprises or Barstool? Is this a Barstool uh, Enterprise? No, just owned by me and... That's what I want to be called now. And we merged with other, obviously you could tell from our draft Bronstein Kings name.com who we merged with, but I'm really not at liberty to say, but you can guess. Okay. On background. Well, I'll tell you on background. Congratulations on the, uh, on that merger and acquisition. Did CTBK uh, help you with that? No, and it's not finalized yet. It still needs to go through federal approval and it could fall through, but that's what I want to start calling myself and what I'm going to buy identifying myself as from now on okay doing business as the dba well congratulations uh, regardless even if it is premature hopefully nothing falls through i know that this it is just a formality at this point but i'm happy for you uh jonah it's good to be back with you it's been a few weeks uh, for various reasons uh, we had some scheduling difficulty and then i came down with the covid and then uh, I tried to squeeze in a couple of uh, podcasts while I was feeling all right, and you weren't able to join me uh, when I uh, spoke with Chris Baker and then with Ken. Um, I was going to talk about, I was going to say Ken Holland, you know, who just got inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. It was not Ken Holland. It was Ken Campbell. Um, maybe there is some COVID fog uh, to be discussed here. But, uh, Jonah, good to see you again. Yeah, good to see your shining face. I been running around at a lot of high school and college events and haven't really gotten to catch up with you and the professional sports teams in the last few weeks. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't even, you say my shining face. So it just leads me to this anecdote because I thought it was funny. Um, you know, Mary Alice Demler uh, pays attention to uh, the podcast and she likes to give me some tips, even though I am working with the competition at channel four, she watches Buffalo kickoff live and will give me the occasional uh, fashion tip or something to do with my hair. And uh, she asked me, uh, how come? Because normally this time of year, I do grow out the beard. Uh, and she said, it's November. Where's your beard? And I said, I have a beard. And I thought to myself, was well, she not really paying attention? She's just patronizing me. She really didn't watch Buffalo kickoff live on Sunday. So I went back and watched it myself last night because I record it, uh, you know, to make sure that, you know, I, I do a little self scouting. And it's bizarre. You cannot tell that I have a beard. She was right. It looks like I have no mustache or beard on Buffalo kickoff live, but you can plainly see it now, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it blends in with the skin tone and the makeup. Is that what is going I don't wear on? any, I, I stopped wearing makeup. I used to, I used to uh, use makeup or at least uh, powder when I'm in the studio, uh, when I'm with Heather Prusak, I will put some powder on to take off from the, the shining of the light. Uh, in the studio, but when I'm out at the stadium, I don't wear any makeup. No, so I, I don't thought know how facial happened. hair was strictly forbidden from the Channel Four airwaves. Well, <clears throat> I've pushed back on that a little bit, namely because Josh Reed, the sports director, also has his unshaven look. Uh, and so, if he's a full time employee and he has he gets to break the rules, I certainly should be able to dress however I want, or at least uh, uh, groom myself however I want if I'm just a independent contractor. Right. I would agree. Al Capaccio has a go. A lot of people, a lot of people on TV, sports center and, and other national shows with facial hair and beards, as long as they're neat and nice looking. 
Yeah, my colleague on the show has a has a mustache and beard. A goatee is a mustache beard combo. So, sure. yeah. So to hell with it. I'm going with the beard. My usual winter process. I just thought it was funny that uh, I I guess my my beard is so pale and gray uh, as I'm now in the back nine of my life, according to the numbers. I mean, I mean, I'm not gonna. I'm probably not gonna live to be a hundred. So I'm in the second half of my life and uh, I have gray there. And I guess it just, when it, when I'm standing further, far enough away from the camera, you can't tell. So I don't know. Does that mean I just go ahead and get rid of it? Uh, I, I'm not the type of guy. I'm not going to color. Well, I, I mean, I I'm not going to do what you want to do. No, but should I get rid of it? Like, what's the on point? TV? Well, I would think, can't... no, I think if you grow it out more, you're going to see more of the hair and more mm-hmm. of the contrast and, I don't know. Coloring, maybe you got to get it dyed. I, I, I go through that a little bit. My I have blonde hair as well as blonde skin. And sometimes when my beard is shorter, it blends and you can't really tell. And unless I dye my hair gray like I did on Halloween, it was a little bit easier to see the facial hair that way. I'm going to I'm anti coloring, though. I think that's too much. You know, yeah. I'm anti toupee. I'm anti coloring. I'm, a, I'm anti fakery. So that's just me. Other people pull it off and some people need it and they rely on it. And that's cool. But the thing I've always thought about your beard is it always struck me how much it looked like Chan Gailey's beard. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, it's very similar. Oh, well, I like it's a, different, yeah. it's a different color than your hair. I'll consider that a compliment. Yeah, that is the other thing that's weird. I do get people who like to bust my balls about my, me dyeing my hair because it is such a stark contrast. You know, we talked about this with Chris Baker last week because he was mentioning that it's a Howard, Howard Stern has the same problem because, you know, he and I, well, all three of us were big Howard Stern fans. And he is always complaining about uh, that people don't believe he has real hair because it doesn't match the beard. But yeah, oh well. So uh, the carpet matching the drapes. Uh, I don't know if there's a metaphor there with the Buffalo Bills, but uh, the offense and the defense seem to be on the same page uh, again uh, after a 9-6 performance in Jacksonville. We had some folks uh, declaring the Buffalo Bills as frauds, uh, that Josh Allen was reverting or falling apart. We even had a video from Kurt Warner, Hall of Fame quarterback, not to be confused with the Seattle Seahawks running back, Uh, But uh, Kurt Warner, the quarterback, was dissecting some Josh Allen film, talking about all the mistakes that he made against Jacksonville. But my column, as it's reflected, and I stand by that, and and of course, I I am not directly refuting or trying to argue with a Hall of Fame quarterback because Kurt Warner knows what he's talking about. But I think when you look at those individual plays in which Josh Allen made mistakes turning the ball over against Jacksonville, was omitting all of the hits that he was taking because the offensive line was playing so poorly. Deion Dawkins has been shaky. Cody Ford was in that game, and he's, uh, he's, uh, his head is uh, spinning every time he's on the football field, even though he was a high draft pick. Uh, he was totally useless against Jacksonville. And then Darrell Williams had to play out of position because of Uh, injuries also and he looked lost even though he was fairly consistent and pretty sturdy at right tackle last season but he was playing out of position because he's a guard now and Jacksonville just totally overwhelmed uh, Josh Allen to the point that that's why the mistakes were being made it's not because of Josh Allen being um, a bad quarterback he was scared shitless he was going on himself during that game. And yeah, you can say, well, we need our quarterback, our quarter billion dollar quarterback to not play like that. But that's human nature. When you're getting destroyed and being chased around, uh, you start seeing players and defenders who aren't even there. Uh, And so we saw a quick uh, recovery. I don't think it's coincidence uh, that Spencer Brown was back out on the field. Cody Ford was not in the game until at the very end in garbage time. Daryl Williams was back at right tackle and Josh Allen looked like the MVP candidate that he had in the weeks uh, leading into that Jacksonville game. So anyway, uh, that was just kind of my take over the last seven days is I was rolling my eyes at a lot of the analysis about how awful the bills are. 
paper lions. I'm sorry, paper tigers is the phrase. Paper lion is the George Clinton book. book. Yeah, I, I get tripped up on that from that from uh, from time to time. So uh, these these bills being paper tigers and frauds and not Super Bowl contenders, and here we are seven days later, uh, and they look pretty damn good. And yes, it was the Jets, but the Jets are on the schedule. Uh, the Jets beat the Bengals. The Jets beat the Titans. Um, what the Bills did to the Jets on their field was pretty impressive, I thought. Yeah, the Bills certainly looked as good as they can look in this past game. It was, again, against the backup quarterback, which has been a bit of a theme in some of the wins this season and some of their better stretches over previous seasons. It's certainly uh, a reach and an overreaction to say the loss in Jacksonville uh, would make the Bills frauds and camp making the Super Bowl. I think they're right now the betting favor, the odds on favorite to win the Super Bowl in the NFL and atop the league and many power ratings and rankings and things like that, scoring margin. However, you see a preview or a game script of how the Bills could lose to various teams. And they've had three losses and there have been maybe three different scenarios that have led to those losses, but there's been some commonality with struggles up front on the offensive line or the defensive line and stopping the run. And you can see that the bills are a little bit fragile in those areas, especially on the offensive line. If they do have their preferred and best five players out there, they seem to perform pretty well and the offense flows from that. But when they don't have all of the offensive linemen that they want out there, it doesn't seem to go as well. And that trickles down to not being able to run the ball and Josh Allen playing poorly. So that could certainly happen again against another opponent, whether it's later in the regular season or in the playoffs. So I don't really think the win over the Jets absolves the Bills of anything that they did wrong the week prior, but it's more evidence and more data that, uh, you know, the Bills aren't going to play like that every week and that they can respond well to a loss and get better and, and improve as the season goes along. Yeah, it shows how precarious that depth is along the offensive line. Uh, now, of course, it was two players out in Jacksonville because John Feliciano is uh, is still recovering from his injury, and then you lost Spencer Brown. Um, John Feliciano will be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, at least that's the expectation. And, um, you know, Spencer Brown is back and looked really good, in fact, especially uh, in run-blocking uh, situations really helped out uh, Zach Moss, Matt Breda, and Devin Singletary. Four rushing touchdowns, which I looked that up. It hasn't happened that often in Bill's history. I think it was only the 14th time in Bill's history. And you think of all the great running backs who played for the Buffalo Bills, or, or even times when they had multiple good running backs. It didn't even have to be the same running back scoring four. You know, it could have been Simpson and Braxton. It could have been Gilchrist and whoever. It could have been... Thurman Thomas and well, I don't think Rob Riddick and Thurman played all that uh, well. You know, you know. Larry Kinnebrew, I think there was some, there were some games. Jamie Mueller, there were some games when the Bills had sure two or Fred three Jackson and Marshawn Lynch. Touchdown. You know, I think. Of well, Joe what is Cribs. the stat? They had four different players rush for a touchdown, which was I don't know if it was the first time in history, but one of the few times that the, the Bills have done that. Yeah, it was a pretty cool uh, thing to see for the Bills, and uh, you know, so Spencer Brown, uh, he him being back in the lineup, and, and Cody Ford watching from the sidelines also played a part in that. Um, How can Cody was. Ford be this much of a difference maker in the wrong direction? It does seem like when he's out there, regardless of what position on the offensive line, things seem to crumble around him. The other offensive linemen maybe have to compensate too much and it hurts their games and their overall blocking schemes. Yeah, well, it's it's a chain reaction type thing. So Spencer Brown not being out there, you have Cody Ford at guard and then – Darrell Williams has to get moved from his spot where the Bills would like him to be at guard. He needs to go out and play tackle. So now you have the entire right side of that offensive line is playing um, new roles that they're not used to and haven't been practicing. And uh, it turns into a, a big mess. And then, of course, Feliciano's not out there either. So he, he's got a replacement there. So that, that takes a little dip in terms of um, the effectiveness of the line at, at that spot too. So yeah, you're looking at three fifths of a new offensive line. Deion Dawkins has not looked good. I don't think um, he still doesn't look like a NFL left tackle. Uh, and I don't know if that's uh, left over from his COVID weight loss, uh, but he's not playing big anyway. 
Uh, he's making stupid penalties on a, almost a weekly basis. Uh, and on he, he Sunday, it cost the Bills from what would have been a red zone and at least three points at the 16 or you know 14 yard line or whatever it was, where Josh Allen made that that bootleg run, and away from the play, um, Deion Dawkins commits a hold that then brings that play back. And then there's a sack on the next play because Deion Dawkins came out of the game and his replacement just got destroyed by Shaq Lawson. And now the bills go in a blink of an eye from red zone to punting. Uh, so Deion Dawkins is, he has been a liability at times. Well, I don't want to be too flippant and speculative about whether, uh, you know, having coronavirus in the preseason is still affecting him, but you do remember Sean McDermott saying how far behind he was coming into training camp and he lost weight. And even if there aren't um, long COVID symptoms going on here, there might be issues with just being behind in his physical preparation and strength and weightlifting that, that, that first month or so of training camp and preseason that he was behind, he still hasn't caught up and that that's become a problem with his game. I mean, he missed that block on the fourth down play in Tennessee. And, and that was a play that you need your best and highest paid offensive lineman to deliver on a very big play like that, just as much as you needed Josh Allen to do what he needed to do on that play. Excellent point. And I was thinking more of penalties, but you're right. He just got totally destroyed on that play, just annihilated. And that was the point of attack for the Tennessee Titans defense. And that's why the bills were unable to pick up that first down. Um, I made a point to mention in uh, one of my recent columns, and I don't know the reasons specific to this. Maybe it's just because Stefan Diggs was coming off such a great season and he got more votes. But Deion Dawkins, the previous two seasons, has been voted a captain by his teammates and was not this year. Um, so, you know, that's a that's a red flag to me um, that uh, the team felt like it needed uh, to somebody else to, to be in that role, at least. And I know maybe it's a blind vote, the team votes and, you know, Stefan Diggs, they felt deserves uh, to be the captain, but um, I'm trying to think exactly who the, who the offensive captains are. I think there might only be two. I think it's Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs. Um, there are three special teams captains. So if you can have three special teams captains, I think you could probably have three offensive captains. I'll look that up real quick, but, uh, anyway, that's another just point about Deion Dawkins. Um, it's interesting in any case when a player is a captain and then comes back and is no longer a captain. It's not as serious as maybe in hockey when you're stripped of the captaincy, but usually when you rise to the level of the offensive, defensive, or special teams captain, that doesn't get usurped by new players. Now, maybe it has something to do with Stefan Diggs was in his first season last year, and now he's established himself as a star player, but that does seem true. a little bit strange. Yeah, for the record, there are only two offensive captains. The Bills have three captains on defense, three captains on special teams, only two captains on offense. So Deion Dawkins, there would be a spot for him, uh, and he was not selected a captain, at least based on, you know, hey, if you're going to have three special teams captains, Reed Ferguson, Taiwan Jones, Tyler Matikevich, um, then I think you have room for three uh, on the offensive side. Well, it uh, he certainly seems like he's still a team leader, especially emotionally and vocally and in the locker room. And that's maybe, maybe why not anymore. Think, well, I think in that sense, he, that's why he merits maybe more criticism when the offensive line and the offense and even him individually play poorly. But then I don't know, maybe if he's not the captain, maybe uh, that absolves him of all blame for any mistakes that the other Bills players are making. Maybe Again, he should be the captain. Maybe that's the difference in uh, the offensive line's performance. Although the offensive line wasn't great. It was great. It was very good for the second half of last season. But there were issues earlier in the season, especially with running the ball. And this offensive line has never really gelled into its ideal form. It's gotten close, but it, it's still a work in progress in getting the offensive line to be good at pass blocking and run blocking. We've sort of alternated with that over the past few seasons. Yeah, one more point I want to make uh, before moving on from uh, Jacksonville. Um, I looked it up because I thought it was Jermaine uh, when a team scores six points in a game and they can manage no more. Uh, is that a Super Bowl caliber team? Does that happen? Well, guess what? It happens a lot for the past five seasons. And in 36 of the 55 years that the Super Bowl has been played, 
a team made the Super Bowl despite scoring six or fewer points in the regular season. So it happens all the time. And teams go on to win the Super Bowl. The Patriots did it a bunch. The 2000 Baltimore Ravens did it a bunch. Um, the Bills, when they were going to four straight Super Bowls, they did it four times over that span, twice in the 1992 season. So, yes, I'm sure it was disgusting to watch the Jacksonville Jaguars limit the mighty Buffalo Bills to uh, four point or to uh, six points. And, uh, you know, they needed four more points, four measly points to, to be able to edge the Jacksonville Jaguars and weren't able to come up with them. Uh, but it does happen. And yeah. I don't think it's uh, – I think that anybody who wanted to write off the Bills at that point uh, probably, um, you know, probably was not, not thinking of, of the grand scheme here and, and that these things happen. And we just saw Miami Dolphins beat the Baltimore Ravens in prime time. That was Thursday's game. Just last night, um, I was reminded uh, San Francisco beats the L.A. Rams. Uh, so all kinds of uh, examples of teams that aren't supposed to win, having a big game, some slippage. Well, Anyways, I, I, just, I just didn't we, want to. We don't like when coaches will say it's a week-to-week -week league and, and every week is a new challenge and a new game plan, but there's a lot of truth to that. And you see that with the Bills that might be the best team in the NFL, losing to one of the worst teams in the NFL, that if you don't have your A game and your A game plan and, and all of your best players in the lineup and healthy and everything clicking, that even the worst team in the NFL is good enough to take advantage of that if they're having a good day and have the right plan and preparation. And maybe a team like that is a little more hungry in that kind of matchup, and that makes the difference. Yeah. I mean, these, these piss poor jets have two pretty impressive victories. You know, I go back, it was, uh, you know, this is just my anecdote from my Browns fandom. You know, they came out of no, almost out of nowhere in 1980 and had a storybook season in which they came very close to making the Super Bowl. And then in 1981, they came back and they went five and 11, but two of their five wins were against the two teams that reached the Super Bowl. So as bad as the Browns were that year, you know, they beat the San Francisco 49ers and they beat the Cincinnati Bengals. They were the only team in the NFL to be able to do it. So, yeah, bad teams still have good players. And, um, you know, I don't, you mentioned Mike Brown as, or uh, Mike White as the, uh, um, the, another backup quarterback. But he went into that game with a lot of, um, with a lot of juice. You know, the Jets, uh, the Jets media loved this guy. Um, he, he was content. He was a good story. And one of those deals where you're in the media and you say, look, we better latch onto this story while we can, because it's not going to last forever. Um, but uh, but maybe that was playing I pretty well. It, I said it in maybe a critical way, but it's also, I think, shows you something about this Bill's defense that if you're not a very good established NFL quarterback, they're really making you look bad and taking advantage of that. And even they did that to Patrick Mahomes as well. And it hasn't had a game yet this season where, uh, so so or average quarterback took advantage of the Bills defense. Uh, Bills have the Colts next at home on Sunday. The Bills are a seven point favorite. Last I saw, um, Frank Reich returning uh, to the place of uh, some of his greatest NFL memories. Um, you know, the, the Frank Reich story has been told a bunch of times. The Bills played him in the playoffs. You know, I don't know that we need to really get into that. Uh, but uh, the Colts are an interesting team in that. They're considered good, but if you take a look at their schedule, they've beaten only really bad teams. Um, and so you wonder exactly how strong these Colts are. And uh, let me just uh, bring that up real quick. Um, Indianapolis Colts this year, they're five and five, uh, and they have won four of their last five. And they've won five of their last seven with the only two losses in that stretch in overtime against Baltimore and Tennessee. So you think, well, that's pretty good. But the teams they've beaten so far this year, Miami, Houston, San Francisco, the Jets, and Jacksonville. Uh, those are the teams that they've been able to beat. Um, playing the Rams tough uh, in week two. They played the Titans tough a couple of times. Um, yeah, they are competitive, but 
maybe just at least on the surface, as far as I'm concerned, they look maybe a bit overrated. They've had some injuries. Carson Wentz has been playing hurt and getting healthier and T Y Hilton and the wide receivers. And they have, you know, if Derrick Henry's out, is Jonathan Taylor the best running back in the league? Are they the best running team right now in the present? Uh, You're certainly up there. Um, You know, and it seems like forever ago, but this is a team that came to Buffalo and almost won a playoff game with a different quarterback, but a lot of the same players and the same coaches. So while it seems like a game the Bills should win, they're the better team and they're clearly favored. It is one that, you know, if the Colts win, I think in retrospect, you could see uh, maybe we could have seen that coming. And similar to the Jacksonville game and how the strengths and the weaknesses align and can the Colts take advantage of their matchup advantages uh, and have the advantage on the scoreboard when the game is over. Another tough game for the Bills to be without Starla Tulele. You mentioned Jonathan Taylor, who, uh, yeah, I think with with Derrick Henry out of the conversation, uh, probably is the best running back in the NFL, statistically speaking. I mean, he's almost at 1,000 yards already, uh, nine touchdowns, I believe, running. And I think he's got another touchdown or two in the receiving game. Um, so, yeah, to be without Starla Tulele, that puts a little pressure on, uh, on guys like Ed Oliver and F.A. Obata. Uh, the Bills signed a guy today to their practice squad. I don't know if they're going to elevate him, uh, but he's a guy who's been on a gazillion teams already. Um, the name's escaping me. I don't have it in front of me. I don't think he's going to be a factor. Um, but yeah, uh, Tremaine Edmonds looks like he's trending uh, based on what Sean McDermott's had to say, uh, trending uh, back into the lineup. Uh, even though AJ Klein was uh, was serviceable and quite the tackling machine for much of Sunday's game against the Jets, uh, but uh, I think Tremaine Edmonds obviously, uh, as long as Starla Tula lays out, his importance is magnified uh, against a running team, uh, particularly. Um, we'll, we'll obviously uh, talk with Joel Staniszewski about those matchups and from a betting standpoint later on in the week. Um, Anything left on the Bills to talk about, Jonah, before we, uh, before we move on? I'm curious your thoughts, uh, and especially with what you've gone through over the last few weeks, on the Bills having players on the COVID list and unable to play. And, and I wouldn't really call it an outbreak, but it seems to be a little bit of a cluster and maybe uh, a player or two passing it on to another player. Is this something that's – are the Bills past that, getting past that, or is it something – it's obviously affecting – every team in every league in some ways, but is this still part of the Bills story this season or have they, uh, are they getting past it at this point? Yeah. Tempting fate, you know, the Bills, this is kind of the storyline that uh, we've been waiting to see if it's, if it's going to happen and it hasn't happened yet, but it seems like we might be on the verge of it. Um, You can, the Bills established themselves uh, before the season began as a team that maybe, uh, if they're not any less vaccinated than another NFL team, they were at least proud of the one of the percentage that wasn't vaccinated. They were at least proud to talk about it and go on social media and retweet things and like things and, uh, and kind of out themselves and plant their flags as we don't care. Uh, or I'm talking about a segment, of course, there's still a majority of the players in that locker room are vaccinated. Uh, but we saw AJ Klein come to the podium uh, after the game on Sunday, and he had a mask on, which indicates, uh, you know, that he's not vaccinated. Um, there are still players on this team who aren't. Um, Cole Beasley has, has said that he, he won't no matter what. So I, it, there are, um, and, and yes, I, I, I have heard, and I don't want to get into a player for player situation, but there are players who have been anti Uh, vax or resistant to vaccination who have quietly gotten vaccinated. I have heard that, Um, but there are still, uh, this is kind of what we've been waiting to see could derail the bills. And uh, they were able to play without Cole Beasley. He, I I don't know what it was, six snaps or 10 snaps. It was, he he played sparingly on Sunday. And a lot of people didn't notice because it was a blowout and that's what happened in blowouts sometimes. Uh, but late in that game, even after Isaiah McKenzie got hurt down by the goal line, I was looking through the binoculars. Cole Beasley was not even thinking about taking his coat off. And I looked a little closer and his shoes were untied. So he was not coming back into that game because he's got that rib injury. Uh, so they can, they, they're able to win without him, uh, a team like the Jets. Um, but 
you get two, three people, four people, um, you know, uh, you get into a situation where Josh Allen needs to come out of the game for a series because he bangs his head on somebody's helmet. Uh, and then Davis Webb, you know, Mitchell Trubisky's back, but for a couple of weeks there, Davis Webb is going to be your backup quarterback. You know, it's uh, you're kind of tempting fate. Whistling past the graveyard uh, is the saying I prefer to use because uh, you're just hoping this doesn't happen. You're, you know, you're just trying to pretend it's not there. Uh, and uh, but it is and it can still bite you. Now, from my standpoint, you mentioned my standpoint. I, I, I think I'm a rarity. I'm, I'm vaccinated, and based on the, the numbers, I'm one in 5,000. Uh, you know, nobody right. in my family, yeah. we're all vaccinated here, no symptoms. No, we were all negative here. I just got it, and uh, I had a breakthrough case. And I think, though, however, you are a – what's the word? We could write an anecdotal lead about you, about how things are going society-wise. If you got vaccinated a certain number of months ago and haven't, gotten a booster shot. Um, a lot of studies have shown you maybe you're getting more susceptible going into that, not you, but a person going into the winter. The cases are rising overall in the community and elsewhere in the country. And if you're vaccinated, your outcomes are a lot better. You don't get as sick and less likely to go to the hospital and die. Right. But for athletes, you only have to test positive to be taken out of the game. You don't have to be symptomatic and get sick. That's right. Unvaccinated athletes are out for longer. So this is becoming a bigger sports issue i think not a bigger sports issue than a society issue but the balance is getting closer you know a year and a half ago it was really all about keeping people alive and sports didn't matter we stopped playing sports now it's a little bit more about you know how does this affect the games on the field because most of these athletes don't get sick and die so some of them do have tough times with it but uh you know it, you could be triple double boost vaccine and Aaron Rodgers and all his alternative treatments and ivermectin and Joe Rogan. But if you test positive, you're still not allowed to play that game. You know, the big story with Joe Rogan towards the end of last week, of course, is what his flexibility and, and what he's able to do in the privacy of his own home. What if that is the true cure for COVID? Maybe that's why he doesn't want to get vaccinated because he's afraid he's going to lose that ability. <laughs> you made you create a, <laughs> A super race. Uh, all the people who can't do that get wiped yeah. out. You know who can do You're that only is. left with people who are able Leaping. to do that. Leaping Lanny <laughs> Poffo. That's one of the things he's famous for. Right. Randy Savage's brother. And Ron Jeremy. Yeah. You know, all these people would be left to, to populate the earth. Well, um, you know, it is interesting. It gets me thinking, though, that you are seeing the Cal football team at half the team test positive. And they had to cancel a game. The um, Ottawa, Ottawa Senators? The Islanders are three games they're postponing. Uh, Damon basketball went on a trip to Texas and played some really good games for that team. And everybody seemed fine going into the trip and playing in the games. And they come home and they went on pause for two weeks. I heard there were a high number of cases there. And, and the issue with that was in Texas, you're not allowed to get tested uh, as often and as easily as you are up here. So when that started to spread amongst the team, they really couldn't get ahead of it until they got home. Yeah, that's all very interesting. Let, let's stay with college here, Jonah. Let's uh, let's talk about college football before we uh, before we totally pivot to uh, basketball. Uh, UB football uh, plays its final home game uh, tomorrow night. Uh, that is going to be against Northern Illinois. Northern Illinois leads the MAC West at seven and three overall, five and one in the conference. Uh, this is an ESPN Maction game. This would be a pretty big game. And I think probably heading into the season, you'd be looking at this one as a pretty exciting game to, to maybe want to attend. Uh, things have gone off the rails a little bit uh, at UB. Um, if you don't want to sit out in the cold, by the way, uh, let's remind everybody, Jonah, that uh, Amherst Pizza and Ale House would be a fine place uh, to go and, uh, and check out the action, the Maction. Uh, the games will be on uh, the TVs there. Um, good place to go as I pull up the, uh, the ad read. When was the last time you were over at Ale House? Uh, probably for the fight, I think. All right. Um, I don't live as close as you. I don't make it as often as I would like, but it's a fun place to eat some pizza fries and read the newspaper on the bathroom wall. That's right. That's one of the reasons I go. But yeah, let me just give them a plug here. They've been a very kind sponsor of uh, Tim Graham and friends. Uh, oh, I was there for a very fun event with uh, 
Vic Rucci and John Murphy and Jason Oh, right. Rucci. The um, Real Men Wear Pink event, yeah. uh, the fundraiser for breast cancer awareness. Uh, how was that? Uh, I was there. I, I stopped in very quickly. I saw a lot of people I know, and it was nice. And I, I listened to, uh, you know, Jay and Murph and Vic and those guys talk a little bit, and that was kind of cool. I was in and out because I had a basketball game I had to go to after that. But I like going to those Real Men Wear Pink events. We went to another one at Kohl's, and I kind of like, you know, supporting that cause and also seeing the people that you see at those type of things. Yeah. So it's a good time to, uh, and it feels good to be able to support your colleagues uh, in their efforts to raise money for various charities. And I've always been appreciative uh, when I've held my events for uh, make a wish uh, that uh, the writers and the guys from WGR and the TV stations all come out and, and contribute. Uh, it's a good excuse, I think maybe to get out of the house too, but uh I have a few beers, a bit on some auction items, raise some money for, for kids um, or for breast cancer awareness in this case. Um, should tell everybody that uh, Amherst Pizza and Ale House is located at 55 Cross Point Parkway in Getzville, and that's right off Miller's Point Highway in the 990. Uh, they have a ton of TVs indoor and on the patio, and I'm saying it, I know that it's getting cold out, but they have the gas lamps out there on the patio so if you do want to go out there, get some fresh air that is warm, you'll be outside and they have the TVs out there. It's a pretty cool uh, little uh, thing that, uh, that they've done out there on their patio for uh, all winter or uh, all weather situations. Uh, there's an awning out there and it's pretty cozy. Uh, recognized by ESPN.com as Western New York's top spot to watch sports. And it's a, a place that Jonah and I like to go, as we've uh, said a number of times. So uh, even if you can't make it tomorrow, you can stop in, call for takeout or delivery. 716-625-7100, 716-625-7100. That's Amherst Pizza and Ale House. Uh, big, uh, big boosters uh, for UB football and UB sports also. They, uh, uh, it's a great place uh, after the games, whether it's football or basketball, it's just right down the road uh, to go in, uh, stop, uh, warm up, and uh, have some food, and, or to watch the game there on Wednesday night if you don't want to sit out there in the stands. Um, UB football, Jonah. Um, things not going well. Um, we were talking off the air uh, before we came on. They're having some trouble even with their recruiting because uh, things have have taken a dip. What's uh, what's your sense well, on, you've seen, on that? So the early signing period starts December 15th, and Mo Linguist and his staff had come in and gotten a lot of uh, notable recruits. You always want to take some of it with a grain of salt, but on the list and the star ratings, they were getting some three-star guys and early in the process, it looked like they were doing a very good job recruiting a couple of those players. Uh, it seems like have decommitted and, and reopened their recruiting at this point. One of them of a notable name, Wesley Etienne, Travis Etienne's brother, a three-star safety. Um, and you know, recruiting's a funny thing because you can watch it and just look at the lists and the star ratings and add it all up and say who won the recruiting game and, and they play the game on the field. They don't play it on the signing tables, but um, it is maybe a little bit of an indicator that high school players were very excited about this program in the summer and early in the season and seeing how they perform. They're less excited about coming here to play. That could absolutely be not be the case. It, a lot of times what happens is a player commits to one school and then starts to get, uh, recruited by higher level schools later in the process and they reopen their recruiting to do that. So that can affect a Mac team like Buffalo that sometimes if you shoot too high, uh, you hurt yourself in recruiting that way. I think Molinguist has always been known as a good recruiter at his previous stops. And I think that they are going to do pretty well recruiting wise and replacing Lance Leipold, whose recruiting classes were never rated very high and never had um, the star ratings and the things like that, that other Mac teams had yet when they come into the season, they had the better players and the better freshmen and the better junior college transfers that were producing on the field. So player development is just as important, if not more important than recruiting. But, you know, this was a team that had extremely high expectations coming out of last season and coming out of the spring when Lance Leipold and most of the starting lineup was still here. They lost the coaching staff. They lost about a half dozen starters to transfer. Um, and now they're not having as good of a season. They're four and six. They could conceivably win the final two games and get bowl eligible. But it seems like that would be um, a, very much a surprise if they did that, having lost the two games that they lost the last two weeks. And now Northern Illinois and Ball State on the road in the finale are two of the better teams in the MAC and the tougher games on Buffalo's schedule. So there isn't much indication so far that 
they're going to be able to win those games. The defense, especially the secondary, is having a lot of problems. And even when they play well in other phases, when they're scoring points and moving the ball to make games competitive, it seems like they have a lot of trouble winning games because of their inability to stop teams and uh, win the game in the fourth quarter. Yeah, maybe it's uh, time to start focusing on UB basketball. Um, well, I mean, it's uh, for the fan. That's the thing with UB football. It isn't like when the Bills and even the Sabres are struggling and the fans get very angry and say something needs to change and we need to see a better effort and what's wrong and fire the coach and things like that. When the college teams around here are struggling, they just lose relevance and they don't get as many fans and people in the media pay less attention to them. So from that perspective, if you're a UB fan or you're a general college sports, West New York fan, um, it's, I guess, good for you that the basketball season's starting and both of the Buffalo teams are expected to contend for MAC titles and have good years and St. Bonaventure basketball and Canisius and Niagara have had some somewhat encouraging early results that you can, uh, you know, kind of move on from the football season and start focusing on the basketball season if you like to watch college sports in this town. Or even the Sabres, believe it or not, uh, are, can you actually hold your attention uh, without totally pissing you off? Um, right. Yeah. Well, I'm curious with the Sabres, is, are the crowds going to go up? Is the way that they're playing and, and they're not winning as much, but they're still playing hard and competitive and entertaining hockey, especially in their own building. Will that lead to more people buying tickets? You can get over the border more easily now. Um, some more Canadian fans. I don't know. I think the crowd was a little bit higher for the Leafs game, but not as high as maybe you'd expect for a Leafs game in Buffalo. And will that it's still an expensive proposition because of the testing that's required for Canadians to come and go. I think uh, it's an, it's a surcharge really uh, on the, right. it's, it's, it, it makes your for a very expensive night at the, at the rink. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to see that too. I think they're playing a, 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 it's relatively speaking an entertaining brand of hockey compared to the past. I mean, I'm not here to say that this is freewheeling and it blows your mind, that type of entertaining hockey, but they're competitive on a nightly basis. They're scoring goals. Uh, I, it's more fun to watch this than Ralph Kruger's teams. That's for sure. Uh, to lose by a goal in a two, one game versus losing six to five or five to four. Um, you're seeing goals. I mean, that's what you want to see when you, when you, commit your time or, or your dollars to, to a hockey game, uh, at least entertain me. Let me see some highlights. Um, I don't want to get too far afield. I want to stay with college basketball. Um, you're covering St. Bonaventure as long as they're ranked uh, for the Associated Press, uh, which is uh, nice to be able to have that to, to do. Um, it almost, it, I thought it was going to end the other day. Right? Well, th tell me, they've played what, two games or three games? Two home games. Far. They beat Sienna and Canisius. Right, Sienna and Canisius. Um, and the competition is going to get uh, noticeably tougher here uh, coming up. But um, your, your take on Mark Schmidt's team here through a couple of games, they, they start off as a preseason top 25 team. They've actually gone up a spot because Florida State lost. Um, Mike yeah, Rodak. They, Mike Rodak yeah, keeping St. Bonaventure off, off, of, uh, off of his ballot. Anyways, uh, your, your general thoughts on St. Bonaventure. Well, they took care of business in two home games against lesser opponents because they're from the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference, but rivalry games that are usually close, or at least especially the Canisius one, they've always played Bonaventure tough. They beat them at the arena two years ago. They took them to overtime at the Riley Center a few years back when Bonna had a really good team. Um, you know, Reggie Witherspoon's offense is tough to prepare for, and it usually gets teams in non-conference uh, struggle to defend it, especially early in the game. And that's kind of what happened, I think, on Sunday. Uh, Bonaventure was very strong in closing out those games. Uh, the runs, I think it was 39 to 15 in the second half against Siena and 39-19 over the last 17 minutes or so against Canisius. And Mark Schmidt made a comparison to playing like it's fourth and one every play. And clearly as, as a contrast to maybe what I said about UB football, they've been winning the fourth quarter and, and, the most important parts of the game in the first two games. And that's what important, but they haven't played well in the first half. They haven't shot the ball well and starting center, the eight ten defensive player of the year, Oshuna Shunye hasn't finished either of the games. He has a back injury that um, kept him out of the, the last few minutes against Siena. Then he played against Canisius. Then he took a hard fall in the second first half and didn't play at all in the second half. And, 
Mark Schmidt said he's hopeful that Oshini is going to be able to play in this game against Boise State down at the Charleston Classic. But looking at the way he fell and kind of grimaced on the ground, I don't know what his injury, the specifics of it, but it seemed like it's a little more in doubt, I think, that he's going to play this game Thursday than it was that he would have played the second game after not being able to finish against Siena. And that's something that could linger throughout the season. I mean, it's got to be a concern that uh, one of your two best players and maybe your most important player hasn't been able to finish either one of the games. And is this an injury he'll shake off before Atlantic 10 play starts, or will it be something that's bothering him and back injuries, uh, you know, they can start small and tend to get worse with basketball players or any athlete. And so I think if you're a Bonaventure fan, you're really hoping that that becomes a thing of the past very quickly. Yeah, upcoming schedule for St. Bonaventure, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, we're going to learn a lot more about them. As you mentioned, Boise State at the Charleston Classic. And then on Friday, uh, they'll, get the, uh, they'll get either Clemson or Temple in the second round of that Charleston Classic. And then if they, uh, I think, reach the final, you know, whoever, uh, I don't know how that works out, uh, some of these uh, round robins. Uh, anyways, I don't have it in front of me. Uh, and then uh, Clemson's Jordan. another team. West Virginia's another team. I don't know if you mentioned. Did you mention those two teams? I There's mentioned Clemson and Marquette. Temple. Marquette's another good team in this tournament. Gotcha. Um, it's a little hard to project who they're going to play because it depends on whether they win or lose and whether the other teams win or lose. But those are the better opponents. And if you keep winning, you're probably going to play the bigger name teams in the second and third round. This is a big weekend for St. Bonaventure. Um, I don't know if they absolutely need to win the tournament and win all three games to stay in the rankings and, and continue to be a team that's an at-large team, whether they win the A-10 or not. But they probably do need to win two of the three, and they need to show well in the tournament overall. Um, if they lose to Boise State, if they don't win any of the games, they only win one of the games, they're going to fall out of the rankings, and their quality wins and net ranking when that comes into factor in March is going to be lower than it would be if they win these games. So this is a very important stretch on the schedule for them coming up this weekend. Yeah, and then next weekend they have Northern Iowa uh, at home, Coppin State at home, and, uh, and then UB at home uh, to start. Uh, that's four straight uh, games in the Riley Center. Uh, they also have Loyola, Maryland. And then December 11th, I know I'm getting way down – the line here, but uh, UConn uh, at the Prudential Center yeah. in Newark. So they have some big games, uh, big opponents, uh, you know, big, bo- these are some big boy schools that recruit. And even though they're not ranked, uh, you know, Bonaventure is going to have to be tested uh, or gonna, they're going to feel tested on pretty much a nightly basis. And, and Bon is ranked. Bon is the highest ranked team in the field in this tournament. And I think that would maybe make them the favorite or at least one of the favorites to win the tournament. So that's, that is the expectation that, they go down there and they beat three good teams and validate uh, the voters and the people who are smarter than Mike Rodak, who put them in the top 25 to start the season and kept them there, even if the first two games didn't go perfectly for them. But I, you got to give, I think, Canisius some credit for playing as tough as they did for three quarters of that game. And because they were picked last in the Mac and in at least one of the polls, I don't know if it was the media or the coaches, and they haven't won a game yet. They lost to Miami, East Carolina and St. Bonaventure, but, they certainly looked like a team that could play with St. Bonaventure, and that should portend well uh, when they get into MAC play. What are your thoughts and, on Niagara? Well, I, mean, well, I was going to say, should I mention Niagara? Yeah, had two they, losses, they, they, but... played, they played tight with Xavier and also Ohio State. And in fact, you know, I, I would say scared Ohio State, uh, both of those games on the road. And uh, Greg Paulus seems to have his guys playing pretty well. That is impressive. And the way Greg Paul has made this schedule, it gets the non-conference schedule gets a lot easier after those first two games. They're not playing St. Bonaventure this year. They're not playing Buffalo this year. They're playing Buffalo State instead. They're playing some home games that should be easier to win. Albany at the arena, I think they'll be the favorite to win that game. And so it was two losses, but being that competitive against the two best teams on your schedule uh, indicates that the Purple Eagles should, you know, they were picked near the bottom of the MAC too, if not, 11th I think maybe 10th and so they're probably going to have a winning record going into MAC play I would think and they are looking like a team that can compete in the MAC I don't know if Canisius or Niagara really are going to win the MAC with how good Iona is and uh, it just doesn't seem like either one of them have the team that this is the year they're going to win their league 
but I think both of the teams are going to be pretty competitive and over 500 or close to 500, if not over 500 and be in the mix to have successful seasons when we get to the end. That's encouraging all things considered with those programs and how, how bad uh, they've been and how much turmoil, especially Niagara has gone through uh, uh, over the last uh, few seasons. Um, UB women, uh, they get to play the number one team in the country. Uh, Felicia Leggett Jack uh, is uh, she's never one to back down. I think that uh, that'll be an interesting uh, challenge uh, for her players that uh, that she will lay down. And uh, I don't know your thoughts on on UB going to the Bahamas to play uh, the best team in the nation. Well, it's an excellent experience for UB program and players. They're going to a tournament where South Carolina, the number one team in the country, Oregon. UConn, you know, the very best programs in women's college basketball are going to be there. And Buffalo was selected to be one of those teams and to play in that tournament. So that's whether they win many games or any games down there, um, it's still a good experience for the team and the program to go and be part of this tournament and get a chance to compete against the best teams and see how they stack up and maybe take some confidence for that going forward. And if you get a win, I mean, obviously that's a huge win if you beat the number one team in the country. They played South Carolina in the NCAA tournament. I guess it was maybe three years ago now, three or four years ago. And they play them well. You know, South Carolina pulled away at the end. They had the number one pick in the draft. And, you know, they, they asserted themselves late in that game. But UB had the lead at various points and was hanging with them for about two or three quarters. And if they can do that again, that'll be a good sign for how good this UB team is with, uh, Deja Fair is one of the best players that has ever played around here, local college basketball. And Summer Hemphill in her sixth season is a very good all-conference caliber player. Um, you know, the weird thing about the UB women is they were picked to finish third in their division in, I guess this was the media poll, but picked to win the tournament. Now, I don't know if that is all these people think, well, they're not going to be so good in the regular season, but they're going to bring it in March in Cleveland. Or if it was just the way the votes lined up, they were, five voters that really thought this is the best team. And then everybody else had them a little bit lower, but they're, they're going to be one be of that the better coach teams. Jack respect. It might. I mean, they're one of the better teams in the league and Mac has been a two bid league or close to a two big lead over the last few years. And if you're one of the two or three best teams in the Mac, you're a very, very good mid-major team and capable of winning games and pulling off upsets in the NCAA tournament like UB has done in past years. So, you know, if you follow women's college basketball very closely and you're looking for sleepers and upset watch and indications of whether UB could be an at-large caliber team if they don't win the MAC this weekend, the games that they potentially could play really could show you a lot. If they beat South Carolina, they advance in this tournament, they might see UConn on Monday night in the championship game, or they might get Oregon in the second round. If they could somehow play all three of those uh, highly ranked, uh, you know, big time programs, that would just be a tremendous opportunity for this team is this uh, felicia leggett jack's last season at ub before she goes to you know I, I don't know that as a reporter anything uh solid on that but i think it's very much a possibility and that the potential is quite retiring high. her jersey and all those things are really, right. really well, seems here, to be yes. paving the way so, for her to come back to syracuse yeah they have an interim coach and if the if syracuse has a really good season under the interim coach then maybe that coach gets the opportunity to stay and, and the timing doesn't work out. But for Felicia Leggett Jack to come out in the press and say, I do, I am interested in coaching at Syracuse over the summer when they had their coaching vacancy. And then after that, the announcement came that they're retiring her Jersey and the friendly vibes and communication continues. I mean, it really just sets up to where if Syracuse doesn't perform very well, or they decide not to bring back the interim head coach, that they've already done the legwork and really got the ball rolling on this coaching transition. And with UB having a good year and maybe advancing in the, the NCAA tournament and, and maybe having the best year they've had under Felicia Legged Jack, if that's how it plays out, would really just dovetail well into the, that coaching transition. But she already has the body of work. It's not as though UB needs to be great this year for her to get the Syracuse job. No, but it, it, it no, it doesn't. And she played there and she's a, you know, a, a popular and, and known figure in that area. But it does maybe help make the 
transition easier if they're saying we're bringing in this coach that just took Buffalo to the Sweet 16. If they have a losing season, that makes it harder to uh, – Women's basketball is different than men's basketball. You don't really have to impress the boosters and the fans quite as much with your hires, but it just makes it a lot more win the press conference type hire if she goes from having an excellent season at Buffalo to then being the Syracuse coach next year. She'll win every news conference anyway. But yeah, she's, she's excellent. Got, at she's got to get another the news conference. Reason why I think Syracuse should and ultimately would be very interested in her because it changes the tone and the culture and the public face of the program in a way that's going to be very good for Syracuse women's basketball if they go in that direction. Jonah, thanks for all this. Um, we'll save whatever we have uh, that we didn't get to for our podcast later in the week. We'll get back to yeah, a we'll regular to schedule. Division three basketball and junior college and right. high school tryouts getting started this week. We got some storylines to watch there. Got to get Nate Butel on here to talk about in trip. Oh, yeah, he'll do it. They had some big wins, beat some nationally ranked teams. Jonah, thanks for this. Well, thanks. Good to see you back here and healthy and ready to podcast. Good, Good to be back. Thanks for listening to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK. The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400 or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions.